So watch, what conclusions would we draw from that, right? It's early, it's nine o'clock, Friday morning, talking about Yellowstone National Park and the reintroduction of about 80 wolves into, national, into the national park and how they transformed the park. Watch, what are some of the conclusions we could draw from that? Um, please. Actions create a ripple effect, right? Uh, as he called it, trophic cascading, right? Something happens inside the system, and since the entire system is connected, the entire system changes because of a small input in the system. One of the things we know in system science, for example, is that uh, if you take your cardiovascular, listen now, system, right? System. It's a closed loop system. If you take a drop of blood and you uh, take that drop of blood in one of the ventricles of the heart and follow, it goes through the entire system and winds up back where it started. It's a closed loop system. And one of the things we know about closed loop systems is that any positive input at any point in the system has a positive impact on the entire system. And any negative input in the system has a negative impact on the entire system. For example, if I wanted to shut your cardiovascular system down, I don't have to shut the whole thing down. I just need to shut down one ventricle and the entire system will eventually shut down, yes? So a ripple effect, right? Any input. Uh, we could draw some conclusions from that, meaning that our behavior on a day-to-day -day basis not only affects just ourselves and maybe the people directly around us, but because of the system, our economic system, our, uh, our cultural system works in a closed loop system, that in fact what you do and the decisions you make impacts the entire system, the entire culture, both in a positive and negative way. So great insight. What else would you get out of this? She said it much simpler than I, didn't she? Right. What else did you get out of this? How about this one? That the system didn't need to be fixed. The system was a self-generating system. That once we quit interfering with how the system was working, the system righted itself on its own. Wouldn't you agree? That, that's a huge deal, right? Because in the world today, I mentioned this yesterday for those that were here for the opening session, uh, when we talk, for example, about environmentalism, there are two attitudes uh, among environmentalists. One is that we have to fix the environment, right? meaning that the environment got messed up and we should go in and somehow alter it from the outside and make it work better. Or the other attitude in environmentalism is that the system knows how to write itself and as long as you don't interfere with the system, the system will naturally come back to a state of its own self-development, self-maintenance, self-healing, et cetera, yes? And by the way, that's our discussion for this morning. These two notions of do we need to fix something from the outside in by injecting something into the system is known in philosophy uh, of healthcare specifically as mechanism. The other notion which we're gonna talk about today and the one that we support is something called vitalism. That the organism, whether it's an individual or an ecosystem, is a self-developing, self-healing and self-maintaining system, yes? So two different ideas, and both of these ideas have huge uh, implications depending on which one you accept and which one you look at. So for example, uh, if you believe that the universe is just a physical machine, uh, the Newtonian model, and that we need to inject things in it to make it right, then what you would typically do, for example, in a healthcare system, is come up with a whole ranges of what the human body should be inside of, and then if the human body gets outside of that range, find ways from the outside to manipulate it back into, into what it, it's intended to be. The problem with uh, the Yellowstone National Park and with that notion is that the environment, the organism is so complex, and we can understand and comprehend such small amounts of it, that while we think we're causing a direct input and change in the system, there are often side effects. And all you have to do is watch television to see that if you take this drug, right, you're going to get side effects from the drugs, oftentimes that are worse than the thing you were taking the drug for, right? Um, I've often said, and I think it's true, the only side effect that seems interesting on any of those are the uh, four-hour reactions to Viagra, uh, et cetera. And uh, I don't know about you, the rest of the men in the room, but um, if, if I had one of those four-hour side effects, I'm not sure I'd be looking to see my doctor, right? Anyway, so any input into the system has a massive effect on the entire system. So 
Yellowstone got that way not because the wolves left on their own. It's because we allowed the ranchers in the West to kill off all the wolves because they were affecting their herds. You follow me? But when we created the imbalance, then the entire system got out of balance and began to die. Does that make sense? So one is the ripple effect, right? The closed loop system. And the other is that these systems seem to be self-developing, self-generating, self-maintaining, and self-healing systems, or what we call vitalism. And in fact, today, uh, it's uh, perhaps if you look up the word vitalism in, the, in Wikipedia, for example, it'll say this. It'll say, vitalism believes that there's more to life than just the physics and chemistry of the body and the environment. There's more to life than just the physics and chemistry of the body and the environment. And then it adds in, it's a philosophy that died the death of a thousand cuts. And the reason is that 300 years ago when Newton came along and gave us the principles of the physical universe we appeared to live in, that uh, science said, you know what, we can't research this thing called life. We understand there's a difference between a corpse and a live person. It's not really a physical difference, but the corpse doesn't have life. The problem is they couldn't stain life on a slide, put it underneath a microscope, and look at it. So they said, if we can't measure it physically, then we're going to give that over to religion. So when Wikipedia says that vitalism is a philosophy, died the death of a thousand cuts, what it meant is that science discarded it as something they could research and look at. But of course, as we move forward a couple hundred years, and as Lynn talked about yesterday, Einstein and Bohr and the gang showed up on the scene. They, in fact, put something back into the equation of our universe, and that is that it is not a physical universe, it's a universe of energy. And in fact, what we perceive to be physical matter in the universe is simply nothing more than waves of energy uh, that appear to be or what we define as physical matter. So all of a sudden, the universe became a universe of energy, something that 200 or 300 years ago they couldn't stain and look at underneath a microscope. But in quantum mechanics and quantum physics, not to get too technical, became the main concept uh, of how we view the universe and physics today. So what they now call this is neo-vitalism, the new vitalism. And the new vitalism says something very simple. Listen now. And if you were taking notes, this would be the note you'd want to take. That, we, that human beings, living matter, that we are conscious, self-developing, self-maintaining, and self-healing organisms. Whether it's a body or the environment. We're, self, we're conscious, self-developing, self-maintaining, and self-healing. How many of you believe you are a conscious being? If I were to ask you to, and if we had time to get in a group and decide what does it mean to be a conscious being, you probably, even though we all agreed we are, what would that mean? So our discussion today, I'm going to say that consciousness means that we have the ability to form relationships, that we have curiosity and creativity, that um, we have the ability to grow and expand and evolve. I, I'm going to say that those are all signs of life or consciousness. Wouldn't you agree? And that when we look at something as a self-developing mechanism, you know, you take an egg cell and a sperm cell and put it together, and within a week, you have a mass of rapidly dividing cells. At the end of a month, uh, these rapidly dividing cells, before the woman is even really sure that she's pregnant, she hasn't really even missed a period yet. You know at the end of a month, you already have a brain and spinal cord? That you have a heart that's already pumping blood throughout this developing organism? And think about this. The greatest scientist in the world has yet to create a living cell from scratch. We clone them, we reproduce them, we combine them in interesting ways, but no scientist has ever said, give me all the elements that make up a cell, and I'll combine them together, and then I'll somehow turn it on and give it life and have it work. Yet your body is producing 100,000 cells every second that you're sitting here, and you didn't even have to go to school to learn how to do it. Fair game? You are a self-developing mechanism. At the end of 12 weeks, you were about as big as the end of your small finger. You weighed two ounces, and yet everything you were ever going to have was there and functioning as necessary. And then amazingly, two ounces over the next six months grew to six pounds or eight pounds, or if you're like my second grandson, Kalen, 11 and a half pounds. And at just the right time, nature said, this thing is cooked, and it pushed you out into the world. And eyes that had never seen would see exactly right the very first time. 
Lungs that had never assimilated oxygen would begin to assimilate oxygen. An organism that was now subjected to uh, viruses and bacteria that had never encountered inside the womb had an immune system that began to adapt it to the environment. It had the ability to change, to adapt to different changes in temperature. We like to say at Life University, our, one of our philosophy instructors, that the body is smarter than the doctor. You understand that the human brain consciously can only hold seven bits of information at a time? And if you want to challenge that, uh, at lunch today, uh, have to call a number that you've never called before. Right? Someone gives you a number, look, you need to call this number, and let's say you have to walk across the room to get your phone out of, the pur out of your purse to, to uh, put in the number. I guarantee you that you'll have to repeat that seven-digit number on the way to your purse, or you'll lose it, won't you? You'll be walking across the room going 555-1389, 555-1389, and if on the way there someone says, do you have the time? Crap, you'll have to go look up the phone number again. That's eight digits, you had to drop one of them in order to accommodate that information. Fair game? Your body, like the environment, is a self-developing, self-maintaining, and self-healing mechanism. Let's face it, in order to heal something, you'd have to be able to replace cells, wouldn't you? And since no doctor's ever created one from scratch, the idea that we do the healing is sort of a ridiculous notion. Doctors, environmentalists, maybe we can facilitate this process, but to think that we're actually doing the healing is a rather arrogant kind of scientific position, yes? So vitalism says this, neo-vitalism says you're a conscious, self-developing, self-healing, self-maintaining mechanism, and here's the trick. Instead of manipulating the system, what you need to do is just get rid of the interferences that are stopping it from utilizing its potential. You see the difference? One's trying to manipulate the system back to what they think it should be, producing side effects along the way. The other is saying, let's get rid of the interference and allow the intelligence of life to reestablish itself as a normal self-developing, self-healing, and self-maintaining system. So hang on to that. This was my topic. It was given to me today to talk about neovitalism. This is a group of people that have been coming to the campus over the last five years, and only a partial list under the direction of Dr. Jerry Klum, the director of our uh, think tank, the Octagon. People like uh, Monica Greco from Oxford, Katrina Kofer from MIT. These are some of the, the most in, uh, uh, important names today in the discussion of not only national health care, uh, but in the discussion of neovitalism. And one of the people that has been talking about this for years is a guy by the name of Ian Coulter. So I want to spend a minute for him. Coulter says that there are five conversations going on in the world today. And I'm going to add two uh, additional to this conversation before we get done. The first one is the one we've been having to this point. When we talk about innovation of ideas, right, we have to start with the assumption that either the universe is a mechanistic physical universe or that we are vitalistic, conscious, self-developing, self-healing, self-maintaining mechanisms. The second conversation going on today is can we look at the environment, can we look at the universe, can we look at people and their health by reducing them down for simplicity purposes to an eye, ear, nose, or a throat? Or do we have to look at them in the whole, including their relationship, for example, in healthcare? We know, for example, especially with women, that people that are in healthy relationships have a higher quality of life and live longer than people that are not in healthy relationships. Even if the relationship is with a pet or a plant, you follow me? There's something about the human experience that drives us to connect with other living things as part of our well-being on this planet. This afternoon you'll hear of Dr. Osawa Da Silva, and he'll be, one of his concepts that I've heard him talk about before is that um, there are only two species on the planets that need relationships for their survival and well-being. Birds and mammals, which we fit into the latter. You know, if a fish spawns 2,000 2, fishlets out in the middle of the ocean, mom just swims off. But with human beings, you can't have a child and swim off and expect that child to survive. So the question isn't whether we need relationships for our survival and well-being. The question is, what are the best relationships for our survival and well-being? Should they be based on happiness, forgiveness, reconciliation, connection, or should they be based on anger and retribution? You follow me? 
What are the best kinds of relationships for our survival and well-being? And so the issue of can we understand the universe and people by looking at them as just a single element for science purposes because it's so complex we have to reduce it down for simplicity purposes or do we need to see the organism in the whole including its relationship with other people and the environment? The next one, for example, is an important one going on today, naturalism versus artificialism. The questions here are, what are the best ways to birth a child, naturally or surgically? What's the best way, for example, to gain uh, immu immunity in our environment for microorganisms? Is it from artificial vaccination or allowing children to be exposed to dirt, dust, and dander when they're growing up? I saw a woman on Good Morning America one day uh, advocating that we create too sterile of an environment. Um, and the woman who was interviewing her said, you mean if my kid comes in and they're covered with dirt, I shouldn't swab them down with antibacterial swabs? And the woman said, no, in fact, you should tell them to lick the dirt off their body. Because she was making the point that what? We have this incredible immune system, and if we allow the immune system to be exposed and develop, our body has a, an ability, as it has for billions of, millions of years, to have its own resistance. The next one is one called humanism versus authoritarianism. What are the rights, for example, in healthcare of a patient and the doctor-patient relationship? Do patients have the right to know when they have a particular problem? All the various treatments for that problem, from alternative to medical, even if the doctor doesn't provide those treatments? In other words, does the patient have the right to make that kind of decision? We see these fights going on right now, just this last couple of days. California just passed a, a law, it's going to the Senate, it's one part of the House in California has passed the law, forcing, without exception, every child to have to be vaccinated in California, right? Do people have the right to make those kinds of decisions for themselves, or does the state have the right to, in an authoritative way, override the rights of an individual and make those decisions for someone else? Our HIPAA laws, our privacy laws in healthcare have come out of this. And the next one is a big one, conservative therapeutics. The question here is an interesting one that we've been posing already yesterday with the workshops. Does regular, low cost, listen now, low cost, low risk intervention, exercise, appropriate nutrition, chiropractic care, stress reduction, et cetera, do these regular, low cost, low risk interventions applied consistently throughout life, allow us to avoid high risk interventions except in emergencies. And of course, the highest risk interventions are surgery, drugs, and radiation, right? They have the highest side effects. So the question isn't whether we should have one or the other, it's not a choice, but how do we utilize those in not only a healthcare system, but in our lives and in our businesses? Does regular, low cost, low risk intervention applied consistently throughout life allow us to avoid high-risk interventions except in emergencies. So for example, uh, this would be something that Life Talks is looking at this weekend, right? We're looking at such issues as yesterday, vitalistic nutrition. What is the role of that? Um, as was pointed out this morning, uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Zanya talked about that sitting is the new smoking in our society, right? Sitting is the new smoking. Right? Do we need to move? Kinesiology. And how do we move? What is the best way for movement? Um, we're going to talk a little bit later today, one of the speakers, in the area of positive psychology. Is there a way for us to have gratitude in our environment? And what does that mean uh, when we're relating to other people in our environment? Functional neurology, et cetera. So these are some of the things that we think are critical. And all of these are low cost, low risk interventions that allow people to not only maintain their health, but the big question is, can we maintain it throughout the course of our lifetime, except in emergency? No one's suggesting that if you're laying by the side of a road uh, after an automobile accident with a split artery and blood is spurting out, that you, know, you need nutritional advice in that moment, right? Uh, but the question is, outside of those high-risk uh, situations, does regular low-cost, low-risk interventions applied consistently throughout life allow us to maintain our health? So here are the two others that I would like to add. So we've got vitalism versus mechanism, holism versus reductionism. In fact, if I were to go back and give you a test, here we go. 
So Life Talks, right? You've been a participant at Life Talks for a day and not quite an hour. Some of you just an hour. But if we were to go through this, and I were to quiz you right now and say, vitalism or mechanism? Vitalism. Holism or reductionism? Naturalism or artificialism? Humanism or authoritarianism? Conservative therapeutics or high-risk intervention? Welcome to Life Talks. You follow me? This is the unique platform that this program is about because we think these are the important conversations that need to be going on and need to be had in the world. Everyone with me on that? Whether you agree with them or not, these are the issues. This is my daughter, Alexis. Uh, she was uh, not quite 20 years old at the time. And uh, my oldest grandson, uh, Kalen, who's now 16 and the hotshot quarterback on the high school football team. Uh, I love this picture. It was one of the last pictures of my daughter before she passed away. Um, she woke up one day having difficulty breathing at the art school she was studying at in Los Angeles. And we brought her back, and she had a tumor around her heart. We took her in, and they wanted to go in, as appropriate, and get a tissue sample to find out what kind of tumor it was. What would be the way to address it, to attack it? And before she went in, uh, the doctors wanted us to sign a paper that they could do whatever they wanted to when they got in there. We said, no, we'd like a really conservative approach. Go in, get the tissue sample, let's see what it is. And the doctor said, well, I want to go in and collapse the pericardium around the heart. The pericardium is a sac around the outside of your heart, and it's got fluid underneath it. Kind of allows your heart to pump, lubricates it, right? So it's not rubbing against other stuff in lay terms. And it was swollen up. This is why she was having some difficulty breathing. And they wanted to collapse it. And I remember, I'll call it the argument I had with the doctor. I said, first question I asked, well, what are the side effects, potential side effects of collapsing the pericardium? And he said, there are none. Now, there's no way you can do something inside the body. And even if it's a remote possibility, there's the possibility of a side effect. He said, there is none. I said, I don't believe it. And we actually had an argument about it before they rolled in. We said, you only have permission to go in and get a tissue sample of the tumor. They took her in. They decided on their own when they were in there to collapse the pericardium around her heart. When they did that, the tumor, because the body is an intelligent thing, isn't it? That's what neo-vitalism tells us. The body is smarter than the doctor. You know why the pericardium was full of fluid and swollen up? Because it was holding that tumor off of the arteries running to her brain, carrying oxygen to her brain. And as soon as they collapsed the pericardium, quote, so she could breathe easier, that tumor laid right down on the arteries, and she was dead in just a couple of moments. Watch. I'm going to add a new thing into Cotter's work. Last one was conservative therapeutics versus high-risk interventions. I'm going to suggest to you that maybe in these discussions we're having in the world, we ought to be having a discussion about the difference between partnership and arrogance. Wouldn't you agree? Partnership with each other, partnership with our leaders, partnerships with our healthcare system versus the arrogance that one individual or one group has all the answers to the problems on the planet. Yes? I have to tell you, I carried that around for 15 years, those two doctors. Carried that around. I won't go into the rest of the story. Until last November, um, had the opportunity to have a private audience with the Dalai Lama. He was here with Emory University and uh, as many of you know, one of the things he does when he comes here uh, to maintain his chair that Richard Gere holds for him, uh, pays for him at Emory University, is to hold a large uh, citywide lecture. And um, uh, it was out at the Gwinnett Center. There were some four to 5,000 people there. Um, and it was sort of an amazing day on a couple levels. Uh, there's a guy that you're going to meet this afternoon, one of the speakers by the name of Richard Moore. Uh, Richard Moore is out of Northern Ireland. You'll learn more about him later. 
The Dalai Lama calls him his hero. Now, the Dalai Lama, when he comes to the United States, is considered a head of state. So he gets automatically from the US government uh, uh, intelligence uh, protection. So always around him are 10 guys in those black suits with the little things in their ears talking in their wrists as if no one's noticing, right? But there's always those 10 guys around him. Unfortunately, the Dalai Lama is also considered a terrorist, uh, remarkably in certain parts of the world like China because of the issue with Tibet. So the government also has to provide him military protection. So there are also always 10 guys in military fatigues with automatic weapons, knives and grenades strapped all over their bodies around him. And so he was at the Gwinnett Center speaking, and he spotted Richard, who he calls his hero. How'd you like to be called the, the you, you would be the hero of the Dalai Lama. And you'll learn more why when you hear Richard this later today. And the Dalai Lama saw him sitting up on the front row and said, he was in the middle of his lecture, and he goes, oh, there's my hero, and decided he was going to walk off the stage into the crowd and talk to Richard Moore. And of course, the CIA and the military people went totally insane that he was going to walk into the audience without you know, them being there anyway. And you'll hear Richard's story this afternoon. But basically, he was shot at the age of 11, I believe, by a British soldier and blinded for life. Met that British soldier 33 years later and forgave him publicly. And as the Dalai Lama said at the Gwinnett Center when he was in the crowd with Richard that day, and I can't do a Tibetan accent, I wish I could because it was really humorous. He said, I go all over the world talking about forgiveness, blah, 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 blah. You'd have to hear blah, 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 blah in Tibetan to understand how funny that sounded. He said, I go all over the world talking about forgiveness. This guy did it. This guy did it. He's my hero. So right after that happened, I happened to have a private audience with the Dalai Lama that day. When you meet the Dalai Lama, it's sort of a, an unusual experience. Uh, they give you this. If, I even saw this, I was re-watching the movie The uh, Seven Years in Tibet with Brad, right, where he met the Dalai Lama when he was a kid, right, in the movie. And they give you this 10 foot or so scarf. And when the Dalai, you hold it like this, when the Dalai Lama comes in, he takes it, he does a prayer over it, then he puts it around your neck, and then you sit down and you have a private audience with him. Again, private audiences with 10 CIA guys, 10 military guys, all the monks and the press in the room. That's a private audience, right? And we were talking about things like neo-vitalism, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, my intention was to invite him to come to the campus and speak to us based on the Center for Compassion, Integrity, and Secular Ethics we have going, et cetera. Um, and he said, you know, when I asked him, he said, sure. And then all of his aides started running around because when he says sure, they now have to somehow make that happen, right? He just gets to say sure. And the night before, it was about four in the morning, I was going down to see him, and um, I thought, oh my goodness, am I supposed to take him a gift? What's protocol for having a private audience with the Dalai Lama? And um, you know, I'm just at home, and the, we're going there early in the morning. I couldn't take him a T-shirt. I just felt that was inappropriate to take him a life T-shirt, you know. Um, and so, uh, what I had was a number of years earlier, uh, my dad I'd found out right when just before he passed away. He was a really quiet sweet, gentle guy, never talked about his life. Um, just before he passed away, I found out he was at D-Day, fighting for us, putting his life on the line. And uh, so I was in Europe when we were watching the beginning of the Berlin Wall coming down. Thousands of students every night getting more and more bold, sitting on the wall, gathering at the wall, chipping away at the wall. And so I thought, I'm going to go to the wall and get my dad a piece of the Berlin Wall, symbolically. And showed up there. Um, it was like Disneyland for social activists. You know, you didn't go with your own hammer and chisel. It's not something you normally carry around with you. Uh, and the, that 20-foot high wall, almost all the graffiti colored part at the bottom, which is really beautiful on the West Berlin side, that had all been chipped away with just cement now. So there's just a band at the top up 20 feet high where there was still this graffitied colored wall, and of course, wanted one of those. You'd stand in line for hours, and when you get to the front of the line, there'd be college students there. They would just pick you up as if you weighed nothing. Right, they'd hand you a hammer and chisel, and then just pick you up right to the top of the wall so you could chip it away. So I thought, you know what? That's something I would give to the Dalai Lama. So I still had a piece left after I'd given some to my father, 
and uh, broke a piece of it off, put it, in, this is the other piece, this is what's left of the Berlin Wall that I keep, that reminds us that miracles can happen. That the rules of experience and history are not the rules that have to govern us as we move forward in the future, yes? That things can change and things can be better. And so besides partnership and arrogance to Coulter's list, I'd like to add to that list uh, forgiveness versus retribution. Forgiveness versus retribution. And uh, after that meeting with the Dalai Lama that day, uh, walked out and after 15 years was able to forgive those two surgeons. Yes? And I have to tell you, I think it's critical. And we're all walking around with it, you know, people that have hurt us, people that have hurt people we love, et cetera, and we carry that with us. And yet, you know what? It stops us from the miracles, right? It becomes our experience rather than the possibility of what we can become. If we're going to become healthy as a society. I think it's got to include forgiveness versus retribution as a society. And so my daughter reminds me of this. My clicker's not worth there we go. Second thing is prosperity of the human spirit, right? So innovative ideas, right? Innovative ways of looking at who we are. Prosperity of the human spirit. I heard this story from Sir Ken Robinson, who's an educator out of England. He talks about this woman, Jillian Lynn, who at a very young age, around the age of eight, was having difficulty in school. And so her mother, and this is a long time ago, decades ago, her mother took her to see a specialist. The specialist examined, talked to her for a while, and then said uh, to Jillian, she said, look, I want you to sit in this room, and I'm going to talk to your mother in the room next door, and we'll be back in just a few moments. And they walked into the next room, and when they left the room, the therapist turned a the radio on, so there was music playing. And Jillian, who'd been sitting there the whole time on her hands, as soon as everyone was out of the room and the music was playing, got up and started to dance. And the therapist said to the mother as they were looking through a window, he said, watch what happens. And she got up and she started to dance and the therapist said, you know what, there's nothing wrong with your daughter, she's just a dancer. Go and roll her in dance class. Well, she probably saw some familiar faces in there like Barishnikov, etc. Anybody know who the guy in the plaid shirt was? Andrew Lloyd Webber, Jillian Lynn, been on to a fabulous ballet career with the London Ballet, that up, met up with Andrew Lloyd Webber and choreographed all of his shows, Cat, Sunset Boulevard, La Miserable, Phantom of the Opera, made millions of dollars and changed millions of people's lives. Yes? Because somebody saw that instead of sticking her on a drug because she was, you know, not behaving correctly in school, and by doing that would have probably robbed millions of us, the joy of her work. Wouldn't you agree? What a great therapist. I'd love to go shake his hand. Yeah? That saw there was nothing wrong with her. She was a dancer. So watch, it's not just about having businesses that are prosperous, but can we allow people in those business to have prosperity of the human spirit? And then finally and quickly, social change. And of course, there's no better place to talk about social change than Atlanta, Georgia. Right? These characters, we don't have time for the stories. People who made a commitment to something bigger than themselves, something they believed in, something they were willing to put their lives on and did put their lives on and their lives in prison. I love this, this. Mandela, right? Martin Luther King. This beeper is not working. Here's a couple people real quick. This is a guy on the right. Uh, you probably, if you know politics, Senator Tom Harkin. Right, conservative, or a very, excuse me, liberal senator from Iowa. Uh, the fact that there's a ramp for people to get in and out of a building or a button to push for the door to open, the American Disabilities Act, that's Senator Tom Harkin. He also created the Office of Alternative Healthcare at NIH when they refused to allow any money to go into research for any other aspect of health, healthcare research, other than just drugs, radiation, surgery for the most part. And he walked down the hall to his friend Ted Kennedy, said, we need five million bucks this year, find a place to put some pork, and let's start the Office of Alternative Healthcare at NIH, knowing that all government agencies, once you start them, will only continue to grow, they never end, right? 
And so the next year it was 50 million, et cetera, et cetera. And this guy, I, David Eisenberg, statistician out of Harvard. I've talked about him for years. Eisenberg was, in 1989, commissioned to do a study on how many people were using uh, vitalistic, uh, non-medical approaches to healthcare, and found that that year, in 1989, there were 37 million more visits to alternative healthcare practitioners than all the mainstream medical doctors and medical specialists combined. Not that it's a competition, but in fact that they saw a shift in how people were living their lives. In the next 10 years, in the next decade, that number grew to 250 million visits. They found that people using alternative health care had higher levels of education. 50% of them had a college degree or higher. Um, people that are most trained in critical thinking. They found that, in fact, 95.6% of people said they wanted a health care system that reflected their social values of exercise, nutrition, stress reduction, natural birth, et cetera, et cetera. And they wanted a health care system that paid for and supported that, not just one that paid for expensive disease treatment after years of damaging and abusing our bodies. Right? I want to skip these very quickly. So the question comes down to this. Come on, guys. Thank you. Thank you. The beeper's not working well. So the question comes down to this when we're talking about um, social change. This is from Clayton Christensen. He came up with a concept called disruptive innovation, right? And he defined disruptive innovation as an innovation as a product or service that is designed for a new set of customers. A product or service designed for a new set of customers. And he defined four types of innovation. Sustaining, an innovation that does not affect existing markets. I'm going to do these quickly. Next one is evolutionary. This is an innovation that improves a product in an existing market in ways that customers are expecting. So, you know, this is putting an eraser on, an, on a pencil. You follow me? It evolves to the next natural step. This is putting cup holders into the car. So this is putting a CD player, you know, after we had audio cassette tape players. So it, it's an existing product, and it just simply evolves that existing product. The next is what's known as a revolutionary innovation. This is an innovation that is unexpected, but nevertheless does not affect existing markets. And then it interestingly says the automobile. You would probably say, man, the automobile changed everything in our society. The problem was it wasn't the automobile. When they invented the automobile, they were so expensive, very few people could afford them. They were a novelty for the rich. You follow me? They did not significantly impact how most people lived until this came along a disruptive innovation which created an entirely new market by applying a different set of values unexpectedly. And they point out it was the Model T. It wasn't the automobile itself. It was the fact that everyone could afford an automobile that changed our society. Yes? Right? So computers are not a disruptive innovation until everybody has an iPhone and can afford one. Then it becomes a disruptive innovation. It changes society in a way that's unexpected. So communications, right? Email versus postal mail. My mom is 90 years of age. All the kids, grandkids, everyone said, we're not sending you pictures any longer. You know, we're not taking photos and going down and developing them at Walgreens and mailing them to you. You want to see what we're doing? Get on Facebook. My mother thinks it's the devil's work, but she had no choice. So I got her an iPad. I taught her how to use it. But interestingly enough, She's only figured out part of it. I, um, I send her emails. I know she reads them. But then she sits down at her IBM Selectric. I have no idea where she gets parts for this thing anymore. Types out the response, puts it in an envelope, puts a stamp on it, and mails it to me here in Atlanta. Right? That's my mom, at 90 years of age. Watch. Disruptive innovation versus how we've sent mail in the past. Yes? Music, right? The old days, you'd hear a song. You'd have to go down to the store on a weekend set some time aside, go through the racks, find the album. You couldn't even buy the one song you wanted. You had to buy the whole frickin' album. You know, you liked the one song and the other 11 sucked, but you still had to buy it. Now you can be flying on an airplane at 35,000 feet 
hooked to Wi-Fi, downloading the one song you want to hear and listening to it 10 times before you land. Disruptive innovation. Photography, you get it. Publishing, you get it, right? I remember we used to have to have metal plates and you crank the thing out like this. If you were going to have a protest, you had to crank out flyers one at a time, you know, back in the 60s. Now you get on Mac, you download it, you send it out to everybody, and 250,000 people show up at the mall in Washington, D.C. to protest. Right? Transportation. All right. Great question. What are we going to do if we had just one more day? We didn't come here to fit in. We came here to be who we are. We didn't come here to work. We came as kids to live our dreams. We didn't come here for the stuff in life. We came here to love each other. We didn't get here by accident. We came here with purpose that is uniquely our own. I saw a story in wrapping up. Mother Teresa was landing in Beirut in the middle of the Lebanese Civil War. She had been asked to come there by a woman by the name of Sister Jean Martin who maintained an orphanage outside of town for children that nobody not only wanted, they didn't even want to see them. These kids were all physically and emotionally severely damaged. And that country had degenerated into a series of local areas run by warlords that controlled all the economics, the materials, the food. And this orphanage had been bombed out. There was a couple walls left, no roof. Some of the walls were half gone. And they were keeping the kids alive underneath suitcases or underneath cardboard boxes. And Sister Jean Martin, having no resources whatsoever, called her friend Mother Teresa and asked her if she would come and help them rebuild the orphanage. And the television piece that I was on, it was live action, was Mother Teresa landing on a 727 or 747 in Beirut. And the plane landed, there were no jetways, the steps came down. And as she descended the steps, there was a mayor and a band and the press was there to see Mother Teresa. And of course, there were trucks. They thought Mother Teresa had brought brick and mortar and an entourage of people and money to pay off the warlords. And all of a sudden, they began to realize she didn't bring anything. There was no money. There was no brick and mortar. There were no people to help rebuild the orphanage. They asked her to come, so she came. And they didn't quite know what to do with her. So she finally had to ask them if they would put her in a car and take her out to where the orphanage was. So they put her in these black limos with police escorts and they drove her outside of town. And when she arrived in this little village, there were about 400 people that heard she was coming waiting for her. And as soon as the car stopped, the people at the back trying to get a feel, a, a sight of her, just pushed the people at the front, jammed them up against the car. They had to literally wedge the car door open in this mass of people to get her out. And Mother Teresa got out and was respectful for her people would kiss the back of her hand. And so she's working her way through the crowd and a small little path opened up. And finally she was done with all of those politics. And she spotted the kid, a couple kids, in this orphanage. And she went over, sat down on a brick in this bombed out orphanage, picked up this little eight-year-old girl, crippled up with cerebral palsy, eyes kind of rolled up in her head. You wondered whether she even knew whether she was alive and conscious or not. And Mother Teresa began to just sit there and look in her eyes without breaking her visual contact with her and just started rocking her back and forth and talking to her. You couldn't hear what she was saying, but you could see her lips moving as she talked to this little eight-year-old girl. And every now and then you'd hear her, she'd kind of go into song. Uh, the only time I'd ever seen that, I had the privilege of introducing Maya Angelou twice. And when she gets up and does her poetry, it's so fluid that it's almost like singing. And she kind of goes in and out of poetry and singing while she's doing this verse. And that's what it looked like Mother Tree. She was just talking and singing. And it went on. You could have heard a pin drop with these 400 people that were watching this. And after a while, because the emotion and love coming out of Mother Teresa was so intense, you could feel it through the television set. A woman came pushing through the crowd, stood right in front of Mother Teresa, looked her in the eyes, didn't say one word, peeled Mother Teresa's arms off this little eight-year-old girl, scooped her up, turned around, walked back into the village, obviously with the intent of raising this little girl on her own. Mother Teresa picked up a 12-year-old boy, even more damaged, began to sing and talk and rock and love him. A little bit later, somebody came from the crowd, 
took this little boy out of her arms, took him home to raise as their own. At the end of the day, every one of those children had been adopted into loving homes. I heard someone mumble one time, boy, that was a great plan. I have to tell you, that was not a plan. You couldn't have planned that in a million years. Here's the issue. It's not the plan. It's how you show up. How do you show up? What is the philosophy you're going to show up with? What are you committed to doing with the prosperity of your human spirit? How are you willing to spend your jelly beans as you go through life? And are you willing, on a day-to-day -day basis, to show up with forgiveness and compassion and love and vision and purpose in life? And if you are, I promise you, we can make a positive input in this closed-loop system one at a time and change the whole world. Thanks for being here today.